these civilizations, I think they've been less than pleased with so far the response on balance that humans have had towards them. Uh, because it's either been denial or fear or xenophobia or f frank hostility. I mean, the Roswell event was actually an electromagnetic system going off that caused these two craft to hit each other and collide and crash. But a lot of people don't know that. It's an FBI document that pretty much states that, that it was a new radar dome. Well, the radar dome had a, some sort of Tesla coil type electromagnetic 1947, circa 1947 electromagnetic pulsed. And these two craft that were seeing what we were doing at the 509th bomb squadron, which was the only nuclear bomb squadron in the, atomic bomb squadron in the, in the world at the, at the time, they weren't nuclear bombs and they were atomic. You know the difference, atomic, nuclear? Atomic is fission, nuclear is fusion. Anyway, um, anyway. But it was an atomic bomb squadron, the only one. And they turned this thing on, boom, and these two craft that were going along, one sort of exploded right there northwest of Roswell. The other one descended and kind of cracked in half or broke up. Uh, near Socorro, and that's where they got the ET that was alive out of it, the, what they called the EB. So there are two ships. Um, but uh, unfortunately, that was a, a terrible event. It was a violent event. Um, so a lot of people have said, well, the, can't the ETs avoid that if they have all these abilities? I said, no, not just because. Just because they have advanced technologies does not make them omniscient. So here's another mistake everyone makes. They conflate advanced civilization or more advanced civilization with being godlike. Don't make that mistake. They're just people like us, but very, very advanced. Now, they may have IQs of 450, so I'm a moron um, by comparison, but <laughs> which I will admit, I am a moron by comparison with some of these civilizations, but, um, <laughs> or an imbecile. Um, <laughs> A primate. <laughs> but nevertheless, it doesn't mean that they become infallible. You know, I think infallibility rests with divinity and the unbounded being, and that's it. Anything this side of it is subject to failure <laughs> and error, even the archange archangels. So you just keep that in mind as you, as you look at this. There's not infallibility assigned just because it's very, very advanced. Uh, it it kind of reminds me of, everyone know what the cargo cults were of World War II? Great story, because this is a great example of the mistake humans make. So in World War II, we were flying you know, these propeller planes and landing them on islands in the Pacific. And we landed on some islands where there were native peoples who had never seen Western civilization or an airplane. And um, when we left uh, and then came back, we came back and we found that the native peoples had made uh, altars and made things that looked like a, a, a biplane with a propeller. And they were worshiping, because it was gods that had come from the sky. And it had become, <laughs> it's like the movie, The Gods Must Be Crazy. You know, the guy throws a Coke bottle out of the window and the people start fighting over this. So we, we need to take a step back and say, okay, these are a very advanced civilization. Some of them may be, uh, I think are, 10 to the seventh years. Uh, millions of years more developed than we are. And all of them are thousands of years. But many of them are hundreds of thousands to millions of years more developed socially, spiritually, technologically than Homo sapiens are. Um, but nevertheless, they're still people. Now, there are people that are very, very advanced. And there are people, some of them are so advanced that they could be mistaken as gods <laughs> in the sort of ancient uh, archaeology and, and uh, the ancient astronaut sort of concepts. Uh, and, and of course, this makes total sense. I mean, if you have uh, something that appears like that, that can appear dematerialized, rematerialize, go straight through objects, it would look like something metaphysical and spiritual. And so there, there is the beginning of the conflation of very advanced civilizations and technologies with the mythology that becomes sort of a catechism and misunderstanding. So we need to be careful not to make that mistake. We need to say, oh, okay, childhood's end, let's understand this uh, and approach these civilizations as 
really advanced civilizations, but because we are conscious and can become in this state of universal consciousness, in that sense, equal, totally 100% equal, even though we haven't developed all the fine points of functioning yet. I mean, we're more dysfunctional than functional, I think you all agree, as, as a species, but you know, we, we can evolve to a higher level of function through conscious development and evolution. And these civilizations understand that. I think, of course, the big concern of the last 75 years has been we, you know, we start detonating nuclear bombs and hydrogen bombs in the atmosphere and doing things to destroy the biosphere and the oceans. You, you begin to see, as one British intelligence guy told me, it's like we kicked a hornet's nest because a red flag went up over the planet after we started detonating atomic weapons that, wow, these people have kind of gotten off the reservation are an existential threat to themselves and potentially others. So that's a perspective I want to bring for just a minute. In the heart of compassion of the Buddha, as it were, is how might humans be viewed? Okay, in the last hundred years we've killed around 200 million people in warfare and continue to do so. I lived in the Middle East for three years, saw plenty of stuff. And that doesn't count just murders, or good old-fashioned homicides. I mean, organized murder, which is warfare. 200 million, well, that's the population of many of these planets that we've just wiped out in a couple generations through fighting over what? An economic system, a religious system, a this system, a that system. So, but then you combine that so it's no longer with swords and maces and even muskets. It's with thermonuclear weapons. <laughs> and in covert programs, these rather fearsome scalar electromagnetic weapons based on these very advanced trans-dimensional sciences. So I think that the, the civilizations are correct to have some deep concern, and I think they need also to have people scattered around the world, everywhere, who understand these issues and will go out calmly, but with a depth of understanding and a depth of experience, and attempt to make contact that's peaceful and mutually beneficial, which is the whole gist of the CE5 initiative, um, the Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind initiative. And a Close Encounter of the Fifth Kind is simply when humans say, I'm going to make contact as a diplomat and initiate it and allow it to continue, however way it flows. And it may be in this dimension, or it may be trans-dimensional, it may be in thought, it may be in part in this dimension and part in another. And sometimes it all comes together in one night and all those phenomena happen at once. We've been out under the stars where we've had objects that have done electronics, people who've had remote views in their mind where there are 10, 5, 10 people see or hear the same thing. A craft then appears that everyone sees, et cetera, and so on and so forth. Now, of course, a whole gamish of sort of phenomenon. And then there'll be these th beings that are moving around us that aren't physical, but that are shimmering, almost like a subtle hologram moving around the desert or moving around the, on the beach or wherever we are. Really amazing stuff. And what I've, what I've found is that people have expectations that are based on, let's go to Starbucks and have you know, a croissant and a latte. No, no. No, they, they, there's other ways that they, they communicate. Uh, and, and a lot of it is because that's edifying, it, that's uh, instructive. It opens up another dimension and aspect. And part of it is just practicality. You know, if you're in an op what's called a hostile theater of operations, using the military speak, which would be called Earth, that has uh, space-based weapon systems that are all out there already, deployed since 1965. I know guys who designed them. That when these objects fully materialize, will target them with an electromagnetic scalar weapon that goes faster than the speed of light. Believe me, they're not gonna, it's not the 50s and 60s anymore where they just would materialize and land everywhere. Now, they do sometimes, but it's risky. So we have to operate with that understanding also. So there's another understanding I want to bring to this that people do not like hearing, but 
you know, I'm an emergency doctor. You come into my ER with a headache and I find a brain tumor, I'm not going to tell you you got a migraine. And I say, you got a brain tumor. So here's the deal. <laughs> We've developed systems that unfortunately are approaching parity transdimensionally with what some of these civilizations have in terms of technology, which means that we are a threat. Um, and also means that, now, not that there are that the intelligence community can't be everywhere at all places at all times, believe me. Unfortunately, when I'm around doing something like this, in, in all likelihood, it is monitored. But you guys, this is why my whole, whole idea is to squeeze the tube of toothpaste so, and get it out, and then I become redundant, unnecessary. If I drop dead, it doesn't matter. Because you guys can do it, and they cannot keep track of thousands, with tens of thousands of people now who understand or are, trying, or are attempting to do this. So I think that's the power of the people coming together and decentralizing this operation. And by decentralizing it, it's like decentralizing it away from, from me and my, my, the center of my operation. Um, because they cannot keep track of all that. Um, <laughs> so don't, don't make the boogeyman in the intelligence community more powerful than they are. It's a little bit like the Wizard of Oz. You know, the man behind, who's the man behind the curtain, you know, pulling all the levers, scaling the bejeebies out of everyone? Now, I'm not saying they're a total paper tiger, but at the same time, they're not omniscient or omnipresent, which means that you guys can do this and have some amazing uh, success with contact uh, separate from me being around. You know, my purpose is just to teach and to let people understand how this happens and then go do it yourself. The medical model is see one, do one, teach one. You see it done once, if you're in med school, you see it done once, and then you do it, and the next time you're teaching someone to do it. Boom, boom, boom. So that's the model. And it works, because that's how it propagates. Knowledge propagates very quickly that way. And uh, the, uh, if, if you take that to heart, um, you, you'll find that you begin to learn these abilities in meditation and the, the techniques of the CE5 protocols go out and do some experiences, and then you have some learning curve, and then you begin to share it with other people. And it just takes off. And we have some great people around all over the world doing this. Like I said, every continent. Um, so that's, that's what I want to encourage people to do and empower you to do it.